thank you very much. Um, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I, when I listened to um, my good friend John Downing's introduction, and uh, he mentioned having distinguished scholars from the four corners here over the period of, of months. And I, I couldn't identify myself in any of those four corners. <laughs> so I said, well, maybe there is indeed a fifth corner, namely the one I was sitting over there in. <laughs> and maybe I, sh I should simply stay in the fifth corner <laughs> and listen to somebody else speak this evening. Um, but it's indeed a pleasure for me to be here. And, um, you know, one of the, another point I want to mention earlier in this presentation it's very rare that I get introduced as professor anything, you see, because um, I'm not a professor. And I'm a senior lecturer. And you see, in, in, a, in, in the University of the West Indies British system, um, where uh, the rank of professor is the rank of professor, not only if you're in the teaching, um, if you get called professor, and you are not professor, as in having a chair, <laughs> uh, it's somehow you look like an imposter. <laughs> so I want to say that I am not an imposter in the sense that I do have credentials at the university, but not the credential of distinguished professor. It is a, a very rare and honorable title. But nevertheless, I like to be called professor. <laughs> so I'm very happy when I'm in America because I get called professor even for five minutes. <laughs> so it's a nice feeling. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I know that you have been through, some of you have been through these uh, lectures before. And you know, when I was uh, invited to speak here and I looked at the, some of the issues that you've been dealing with in the Global Media Center, I really wondered um, why we were being asked to come here to talk about the Caribbean because, you know, we are a small part of the world and if this was another place and you wanted to talk about dance hall music or reggae music, I figure I would have a place because then that's the home of dance hall and reggae or the home of soca and the home of some good sprinters and jerk chicken and all of those kinds of things. So I could talk about food and sport and all of these things that are Caribbean famous and which uh, we are happy to um, share with the rest of the world. But seriously, I said, well, perhaps what's happening to us uh, in the region might be of some interest to you as persons interested, people interested in what's happening to media and culture and communication in this postmodern period of the world, because it is indeed a very bewildering period. You know, when I began in this business as a reporter um, with the Jamaica Broadcasting Corporation, uh, life was simple and life was exciting, because uh, in those days we had two radio stations in Jamaica, and you were for one or the other, and, and um, you listened to one or the other. And if you had a, a shortwave radio, you could perhaps um, pick up the BBC or Voice of America. And sometimes at night on your AM radio, you could pick up WINZ in Miami. We kept calling it WINZ, but they keep, they, they, they keep calling it WINZ. Um, <laughs> That last letter of the alphabet looks, looks more like a Z to me than a Z, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so we learned, um, we heard Sarah Vaughan and Duke Ellington and all those kinds of things. And so we got to know America in a way through radio. Um, Armed Forces Radio, BBC Radio, and got a view of the world. So all of that has changed, and perhaps what I'd like to do this this afternoon is to talk with you briefly about some of those changes and then perhaps to leave enough time for questions because I think uh, it will be more interesting for us to, to share than for me to stand here and give 
a lecture in a formal sense because at, at the, at what new am I going to tell you? Tell me something new. That's what you want to know. What is new and different? And I also want to hear something new from you. Now, I'm going to briefly remind you of the Caribbean then look at some of the main factors that are changing the media in, in our region and some of the ways in which our media industry has been uh, responding to that. And then towards the end, we will look at some future directions for the industry and for um, policy makers. Now, for purposes of this presentation, the Caribbean I'm describing as the English-speaking Caribbean. And knowing full well that's not the entire Caribbean. Um, it's not even the larger part of the Caribbean. I'm referring to the 13 or so islands and Guyana and Belize on the South and Central American mainland, which were part of the British colonial experience. The group of countries that now, from Bahamas in the north to Trinidad in the south, and I deliberately don't have a map so that you can just go there with me through your mind's eye, um, rather than seeing it on a map as well as uh, we go far west to Jamaica and Belize, and then east to Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean. All of that in the Caribbean archipelago. Beautiful place to spend vacation if you um, ever want to get away from winter, and if you ever want to find uh, a part of the world which, not unspoiled, but where people and friendships and good food still commingle. Now, in those multicultural societies, um, we, we fashioned um, societies which are predominantly, uh, in terms of ethnicity, predominantly black, African American, but also, um, and by African American, I simply mean that. Um, we are part of the Americas, not part of the United States of America, but Americas. And we are originally people out of Africa. But that's not the whole story. It's a story of, of Chinese people, of people from of Indian origin, of Europeans, um, a very strong mixture of per people from um, the, 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 the Middle East. And I should pause to tell you that in Jamaica, we call every Every Arab we call a Syrian, right? Whether you come from Lebanon or, or Saudi Arabia, we have one word for Arab people, Syrian. And the reason is simple. The first merchants who came to Jamaica to sell dry goods were Syrians. So the others who came, we never made any distinction. We call them all Syrians, and they all answer to being Syrian. Whether, whether, uh, perhaps Jamaica is the only place um, where um, they would accept being called Syrians. <laughs> because, because they know that in Jamaica, we take it to be out of many. We are one people. It's not a big thing for us. <laughs> you know, so. And so that eclectic group of people fashioning societies and cultures and, and so on. And in terms of our media development, I want to talk about three distinct periods um, an early period in which the pre-independence period from the 1940s through the 1960s, and then a period in which the media became under greater national ownership, and then the current period in which we have seen privatization, liberalization, and the impact of the internet. Now, in the pre-independence period, that we're talking about, most of the media in our part of the world were owned um, by uh, external f um, owners, mainly British. The exception in newspapers was the Daily Gleaner in Jamaica, um, which had been owned by Jamaican families um, um, from 1834 and is arguably uh, one of the longest um, continuing publications in the English language. 
Um, occasionally, over the, over the last um, period since 1834, they have perhaps have missed a couple of days because of strikes or earthquake or hurricanes or whatever it is. But it has been a continuing publication over this period of time, so make, making it quite an old newspaper. But aside, apart from the Gleaner, um, a lot of the ownership of papers was um, by British media magnates, um, Cecil King and Roy Thompson being the two major ones. Um, in, this day, in these days of um, Berlusconi and, um, and Sony and Columbia and, um, and the other uh, media giants, it is perhaps only the historians who might remember that um, in back then in the 50s, the um, Cecil King's um, International Publishing Corporation was the largest, published, largest, me largest media company in the world, <laughs> you, you know, um, owning newspapers wherever the British flag flew. And the British flag flew in a lot of the world. And so they, they got their, their papers in those parts of the world. Um, then in radio, a company called um, uh, British Rediffusion uh, owned the four uh, largest uh, radio stations um, in, the, in the region at the time, uh, Radio Jamaica in Jamaica, Radio Trinidad in Trinidad, um, Barbados Rediffusion in Barbados, and um, in Guyana, uh, I think it was called Burbis uh, Radio. Um, Radio Demerara, sorry, in, in, um, in, in Guyana. And there were also, in the Eastern Caribbean, there was the Windward Island Broadcasting Service. So all of these were radio stations owned by British interests. Um, and Reuters and the BBC were the main sources of, of, foreign, uh, of foreign news. Um, then by the the 1960s, of, of times, of, times of independence, we began to see um, shifts in which um, some of the ownership um, began to uh, be transferred because once the, the British owners did not have the protection of the flag for their monopolies, um, then you know, it was not as attractive to remain in the regions and also um, they where they had to face the national response, the national outpouring of sentiment for a national ownership of newspapers. And so they had to um, deal with that situation. In Trinidad, for instance, where um, nationals led by um, Ken Gordon, who is one of the major um, owners of private media in the region now, um, in his book, um, Getting It Right, uh, he noted uh, that the the British uh, media owners, including Thompson and King, neither had the stomach nor the concern for conflict with governments, and so they easily acquiesced to the official view that a responsible press is a docile press, so that once so, so, so they, they didn't get, engage themselves in struggles of people for freedom and independence because um, they were not, that was not their struggle, that was not their issue, their issue was to retain the British connection as long as possible and retain their, um, uh, their source of power. So there was a gradual shift of, of ownership from Cecil King and, and Lord Thompson to indigenous owners, um, which are very much in evidence today. One of the exceptions being the Guyana Chronicle in Guyana, uh, which uh, was not sold to private interest, but was bought by the government and remains to this day one of the few newspapers in the region which is government owned, the Guyana Chronicle. Uh, then the rediffusion for, um, were, was transferred to, 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 to national ownership. I remember in, at the time in the 1970s when the Radio Jamaica, which was one of the rediffusion four, um, owned by a British rediffusion, was uh, being transferred I was then working as Michael Manley's press secretary, and it was in, in this government in the 1970s which this was happening. And there was a big to-do because the, the government already owned the JBC, which was the, the state-owned broadcaster, 
and now um, the government acquiring Radio Jamaica from British Rediffusion would create an even larger government monopoly. And um, there was no desire for that. So the thing was now, how do you um, get national ownership without government ownership? Um, and I, you either go to the market and, and you sell it openly on the marketplace, or you find some other way to hap for, uh, for it to happen. Um, I'm not sure why the market didn't respond. Um, but the market didn't respond to the way the owners had, in, had, had anticipated. So what eventually happened was that the, the ownership became, of Radio Jamaica at that time, a very interesting thing because it was uh, the 51 percent of the equity in the company was made available to what was called mass-based organiza organizations. Um, teachers' unions, um, trade union, the church, and um, other civil, and, and a farmers' union, um, they got 51% of the equity. Then 25% um, of the equity was made available um, to the workers in the station, and the remainder was um, held by the government. Uh, over time, that ownership changed and the government gradually sold its, its equity. Um, and I think a lot of the workers and the trade unions took profit and ran because they made huge profits. Um, so they took the profits. And now the company is a publicly listed company um, and still has a, a, a shareholding structure in which no individual or, or, or group or entity can own more than 7.5% of the shares. That has become very controversial because one of our richest men in Jamaica wanted, he has 7.5% in it, but he wanted to buy the whole thing and he wanted an annual meeting to change the shareholding structure so that he could become a majority shareholder. Well, the, the teachers and the church people and the farmers, and they said no, they said they're quite happy with the way things are. Because one of the things that um, a lot of teachers had a lot of their pension money in the station. And so they know that every month they'd get a little check, a little dividend check from their small shareholding. And that was, they were comfortable with that. And they didn't want to see Mr. Michael Leachin as the sole owner or majority owner. So the ownership remains um, at a 7.5% ceiling for any individual or, or group. So, in a sense, I think that's a fairly democratic form of ownership. So although it is a private company, it has a lot of characteristics of a public company because of that um, mass um, uh, ownership. Um, and, from a, and from a concept when the fear was that it was going to add to the government's tables, you can see this was quite um, creative. Then, of course, um, as I said, Radio Antilles was um, the other station in the Eastern Caribbean, privately owned. Uh, which was also part of the mix at that time. So we moved then from foreign ownership in which the concentration was on keeping things as they are to national ownership, which um, was a lot more concerned with development and also with public involvement um, in media and a lot more interactive, uh, interactive engagement. But um, there were also some other other kinds of issues. In, in concert with those changes in the ownership, we also saw changes in the institutional arrangements in the uh, media in the region. From as far back as 1967, the, the heads of government um, proposed that a, a news agency be created to report on and to reflect Caribbean reality because, or, or, or the world was explained to us by Reuters and the Associated Press. Um, and so governments had that drive to start, to, to, to get it started. It ran into a lot of difficulties. Um, as you see, it didn't really take hold until 1975, although the idea was first mooted as far back as 1967. Because there was opposition on the part of the private media in the region, because you remember what I told you that a lot of the ownership being transferred from British to local hands, and the local hands were very skeptical of government. 
right? And sometimes with good reason, because in the period of national ownership of radio, many governments, including the government in Jamaica, saw the national radio stations almost as a prize of political office. You win the election, you win the radio station. And, um, and you keep the radio station as part of your communication, political propaganda, keeping out your opposition, keeping out opposition forces and voices. So there was um, reason, genuinely reason, to, to, um, to be concerned. But, and, and if some of us may even go back to remember that this was also part of the period of the early debate within UNESCO of the new international information and communication order, uh, and, all, and that created its own dynamic in which um, a lot of the Western press, the United States in particular, and, and Britain and Singapore, left UNESCO at the time, Britain and Singapore uh, and United States left UNESCO because they felt that UNESCO, rather than promoting freedom of expression, was promoting um, government control of expression. Right? So what I'm saying is that on the one hand, there is a genuine desire to repatriate information and to um, de 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 have information and, and supporting your own culture and society. Right? But at the same time, there's a genuine concern that too much government control of that process can lead to government control and very much stifle the very freedom that you want. So that debate took a long time to happen before Kana came into being and, the, um, and then CARMAC, the Caribbean Institute of Media and Communication, to which um, Professor Padovani mentioned that I'm associated came in for the training of journalists so that we were concerned both with the de development of media institutions and development of media professionals. The two things were seen as, as going hand in hand. And forming the Caribbean Broadcasting Union as the, 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 other, peg, the other leg of the institutional arrangement to uh, give expression to the ideas of um, regional integration because we were, f the feeling in the region that although we were 12, 14 separate islands and territories, that there was a commonality of history and culture um, that brought us together and therefore communication and media, because we're separated by sea. But um, if you look at it, one, look at the, the, the map of the world one way, it looks as if we're separated by sea. If you look at it the way I look at it, we are joined by the sea. Um, so rather than seeing the sea as a point of separation, you can see the sea as a point of contact. The sea is what connects us, um, and the history, and the culture, and the language, and, and all of those things. So we are flirting with the idea of regional integration at the political level from time to time, but we have not quite made it. But throughout the period, from the period of the 1960s to the present time, there have been continuing efforts to get um, regional integration supported by a communication and media infrastructure. The arguments between the private and the public eventually um, died, and now within the Caribbean Broadcasting Union are both public and private owners. I digress to say that one of the problems that they encounter all, all along is managing the commercial aspect of an organization that's both governmental and, and private. I'll give you a concrete example. Cricket, anybody here knows cricket beside John? <laughs> okay, a couple of you have an idea of what cricket is. Well, my friends from Pakistan and Bangladesh understand the passion of cricket, and I can only tell you that baseball is without passion by comparison. <laughs> if you understand that, you have an idea what we're talking about. <laughs> but um, when we're playing cricket at the test cricket level, West Indies playing against England or Bangladesh or Pakistan or India or Australia, um, just about everything stops. On a, on, a, on a really important test match, government and the economy and politics, all of those things take second place while you listen to the radio. Or Now, the broadcasting of these games is, there, is very important and is commercially very important. But the rights for major sporting events 
uh, particularly in the last couple of years when uh, salaries for athletes of, of any kind have become astronomical, maybe not like um, LeBron James, but, um, uh, but still, still in our part of the world, still huge salaries uh, nevertheless. Um, I, I think um, Sachin Tendulkar in, in cricket perhaps earns as much as any um, American athlete of a similar nature because he is a super, super, super star. So I'm sitting at a meeting of the Caribbean Broadcasting Union and we're buying the rights for sports, for cricket. And the, because we are not for profit, the, the rights cost is shared by the member stations plus a 10% for administrative arrangements. But everybody has to pay for it for it to work. And there's a, there is a, it was worked out in a fair, fair equity, you know. Um, a Jamaican station um, would pay 24% um, of the cost, uh, Trinidad 20%, and down to smaller station pay 1%, etc. Okay. So there's a station in Grenada that has not paid their dues. They don't have the cash. And the prime minister calls on the phone to say, I want the cricket on the station. <laughs> you know, I would say, but Prime Minister, your station is in arrears. <laughs> no, no, it's not easy to be a board member of the CBU telling the Prime, not the Prime Minister, Secretary, the Prime Minister <laughs> on the phone in a board meeting saying, I want the cricket. <laughs> now, the Prime Minister gets the cricket. And we go into the red. <laughs> because the others, and then other people say, oh, in that case, I'm not paying my share either. Because all I need to do is delay, 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 and the day of the game, the Prime Minister picks up the phone and calls, <laughs> and we get it. So that, that has dogged the ability of the, the regional arrangement to develop a mechanism to aggregate and distribute content whether it's of sport, culture, entertainment, news, whatever, um, because unless everybody pays, it doesn't work. And everybody doesn't pay. Right? The, 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 the alternative is to um, make it into a completely commercial operation. Right? And this is what has been done to some extent. But that did not work either, because the government-owned stations did not want a commercial operation because every prime minister wants the ability at the end of the day to call on the phone and say, I like the cricket. <laughs> and no private investor is going to put money into a Caribbean media corporation where that can happen. So that's why the project remains in limbo. How to get that happening? All right. And in, the, in between the, the, all of that now, as I said, the, we, we are now in the, in the current period in which um, we have the uh, period of market liberalization, consequent on the things that you all are, all are aware of, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Washington consensus, um, the, the magic of the marketplace, and all the things that you are uh, all familiar with. I don't need to bore you with, all, with, with those details. Um, um, the market won, you know, and the market rules, the market won, the market rules. So that um, from 1989 onwards, uh, all our governments have been adopting more market policies in their domestic eco economic arrangements, and the state media became, was also a part of that. Somebody asked me today, uh, all, and I, I need to make the point again as, as well, that there, there's a mixed view about the state ownership, because people in the region don't have an intrinsic opposition to governments owning the media, but they have a fundamental opposition to the governments using that ownership to promote themselves at the expense of the opposition or civil society groups. Okay? And that, uh, and because, uh, I mean, we are a region of open democratic societies where governments are regularly changed in open and, and free elections. 
And so people don't take kindly to government um, control of uh, so, so of, of media um, for its own ends. And where that has not happened, it, the stations um, can continue. So what we end up with is a, a, a regime in which the, the, the market has there's a, been a proliferation of radio license and television license and um, competition in television as well. Um, the exceptions being, Bar notable exceptions being Barbados and the Bahamas, where the governments continue to invest a lot in the public um, broadcast television services and also to keep out um, private ownership. In most of the region, the, the pattern is competition between the state sector and, uh, uh, and, uh, and the new licenses being private, okay? Um, and then, of course, we have uh, an international uh, environment in which, um, through satellite and cable, we have a lot of inter international channels. Uh, Jamaica is located, like the rest of the Caribbean, in the footprints of the U.S. domestic satellites, so that programs on satellite that are intended for the southern part of the United States can be accessed quite easily um, in, in Jamaica. And that has uh, fueled the development of the, of the cable sector, uh, which began initially as small operators um, staying in their neighborhoods, um, pulling, getting, getting one dish on their, on, the, on their roof, pulling down some programs, sharing it with, with, the, with the neighbors on either side, then getting more wires, adding more neighbors, the next street, and until you have a whole district. Um, so in 1996, what the government of Jamaica did was to rationalize all of that um, and put this, the, the, the international cable channels under license. Um, and, uh, but, or, but in relatively small units, so that for purposes of licensing, um, the units are 2,500 2, households. Right? which means that you have scores of licenses, although some people some have multiple zones, but you can have an operator with a license in as few as a zone of 2,500 households or add-ons as you, as you so wish. And the idea was to allow the, um, the operators who started off informally, illegally, to be able to operate, because if you had opened up to larger geographic entities requiring more capital investment, um, then it's likely that many of them would have gone under. So it was to protect um, the incumbents that you had um, this system. All right, so those are some of the examples of the the consequence of privatization, uh, as you were told before, in, in Jamaica, the Jamaica Broadcasting Corporation was privatized to Radio Jamaica, which, as I told you, was the output of the, one of the British Rediffusion Four stations. And they acquired both the, 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 the television and some of the radio assets of the um, Jamaica Broadcasting Corporation. In Belize, the Belize Broadcasting Corporation was privatized. Um, in, in Grenada, the, the government station was um, sold to one of the Trinidad um, operators. And in Trinidad, the, the government um, did not privatize the state-owned station, but they commercialized it. So it is no longer in any way, shape, or form a public broadcaster in the sen that sense of the word, but an entirely um, commercial operator owned by the government. And all of this has seen, so the, as a consequence of all the, these developments, that the media in the Caribbean is largely advertising driven. Okay. Um, now, at the international level, the, the growth of the multiple channels have created new competition zones for the, um, the private broadcasters. And in the old days when you could guarantee an advertiser large audience because you are the only game in town or one of two, those, that's no longer the case. So the, the, the number one radio station has moved from a fifth, 
60% market share to a 30% market share. Right? To, 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 yeah, right, to 20, 27% market share uh, over a matter of just five years. Right? Um, and, and so market share ranges from 1% for some of the smaller stations to as much as, as 25 or 30% for the larger ones. So that becomes an issue. How do you um, manage in a commercial environment when your audiences are shrinking and therefore you can no longer guarantee it an advertiser the large audiences that they need? Another issue from this is the issue of violations of copyright and intellectual property rights. Because the, the cable operators, um, sh they offer a lot of these US premium channels, which are not available for sale in our part of the, the world. So what happens is that um, a, a cable licensee in Jamaica, for instance, would apply for a license on the basis that he's offering these 15 or 20 channels for which he has a licensing arrangement. Um, and he does have a licensing arrangement. Home and Garden, um, the cooking channel, uh, hairdressing, I don't know. Uh, so, he, so he comes to the commission and he gets his license on that basis. But he goes to you to sell you his channels and it shows HBO and Cinemax and all the premium channels in the United States. And he, he doesn't pay for them because he says, when I offer to pay for them, HBO says they are not for sale because they are only for sale in the domestic United States. And, and, um, and so that's not, so, so the operator says, well, I have tried to buy it, but so I have done my duty by trying to buy it. The seller won't sell me, therefore I've done my duty. The, the regulator takes the view that um, they are regulating the licenses which they have, and um, they would respond to complaints. The regulator is not going to go out to look um, to see if John has HBO illegally, um, that's for HBO to complain. So if HBO doesn't complain, the regulator doesn't go out to find it. But there's a huge issue because what the United States has done is to tie the copyright to trade issues. Right? And, and so a lot of um, even American aid on the Caribbean Basin Initiative is tied to um, compliance with copyright arrangements. And, and so each year, the State Department publishes a list of countries who are or are not in compliance of their copyright arrangements. And um, they have Jamaica as one of the countries that is trying. So, um, <laughs> because at least there's a license. But it remains, it, it remains a large problem for the region because, and it goes throughout the entire Caribbean region. First, people are accustomed to these high value content which are not, not available. So it is politically unfeasible to take them off. Um, and, the, and so unless the United States and the owners here make the, a, a complete pressure to um, um, for that, then it's not likely to happen in the, in, the, in the near future. But it does have a continuing problem. I mentioned earlier on the high cost of broadcast for international sports and so on and the unauthorized access to product, um, which creates some market distortion because the broadcast stations are buying the content at the copyright market level because they are visible and easy to find, whereas the cable operators under the radar um, are not. So, 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 so they can offer product at prices uh, which are outside the market. In Jamaica, for instance, um, for 120 channels of cable, including um, a dozen or more premium channels, um, you probably pay the re in equivalent of about 15 or 16 US dollars per month. Um, no, for, for that kind of lineup here, you probably pay what, $100 or thereabouts, I don't know. Um, so you see the level of market distortion that, uh, um, that we're talking about there. So that's the, that's the new landscape, um, very difficult. Um, uh, and, and advertising driven media in which um, the competition for advertising dollar is getting stronger and stronger. Now, the, the, 
the media, the mature media, radio, television, newspapers, um, are trying to respond, but they have to, they have to face um, the, the number of issues. Uh, one of them is this legal and regulatory framework um, that I just mentioned. Um, another one which I want to spend a little bit of time on is what I call the awards in libel and defamation cases. Because in, in recent um, years, there have been several large libel awards that have been granted by the courts in Jamaica. One of the, um, uh, the most egregious was one with a minister of, of government who sued a newspaper for a story uh, which said that he had accepted um, bribes under the table uh, when he was minister from an advertising agency that worked for the government. The story originated with, with the Associated Press out of New York and was carried by the Gleaner. And um, Associated Press retracted the story, saying they, they, they had rechecked and they, didn't find, they don't think they have a basis for the story. The Gleaner nevertheless carried the story and continued to carry the story. Um, to cut to the chase very quickly, um, after um, 16 years of going back and forth through the courts, um, the, 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 the ex-minister won a large award. If initially, the, he won an award of um, $2.3 million, US dollars, um, which is huge damages um, in, 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 a, in a company that doesn't make that in profit in a year. Um, after appeals, it was reduced to a little over a million dollars, but still, um, where I come from, a million dollars is still a, fairly, a fair amount of money. Um, what that has done is to, to create a kind of chilling effect on, on journalism, because uh, that in conjunction with other awards, because it's not the only one, um, that, that has been quite substantive. And um, so the reporting um, has been less aggressive, and there's a lot of demand for reform of the libel laws um, to bring them more in line with the United States, where public officials have difficulty suing after the Sullivan versus New York Times uh, famous case of the 1960s. Um, there is a process now to review that, and the, I'm not sure where the process um, will, will end, because the new prime minister who was elected in the elections on um, September 3rd, um, Bruce Golden, has promised to reform the, the, um, the laws because he believes that the libel laws should not be, in his words, a shield um, behind which um, um, corrupt public officials can hide. Now that he's prime minister, I don't know if he will say the same thing, uh, but certainly he said it very loud and clear um, when he was in the opposition seeking um, the support of the media for his election. <laughs> he got the support, he got elected, so we see uh, what, will, what will happen. We also have... Um, under the commercial pressures, declining standards in journalism, um, people are not um, staying long enough in the profession, um, people graduating out of our university and other universities in Jamaica, enter the media, stay for a couple of years, um, leave, they get more money in um, either new media environments or more fun, um, and certainly more money in um, public relations, advertising, and social marketing. So um, keeping good people in journalism is one of the um, challenges um, facing, uh, facing us. Um, as well as what we now have is obviously a brand new um, um, workplace um, in the internet environment and a new workforce of young people with different kind of attitudes and expectations. So that has been also one of the challenges to which they are beginning to respond with a number of, of strategies. And I'm gonna try and finish it up quickly, um, such as trying to manage cost, um, diversifying revenue sources by um, things like less dependence on advertising, um, uh, the older media reselling ar ar archival material, We've also seen a fair number of mergers and acquisitions as small media companies are, are taken up by, by new ones, leading to um, the pan-Caribbean media um, 
environments. The number of stations, um, add, adding platforms so that, for instance, if you get a license, um, you will then create, instead of having just one music channel, you would have three music channels, um, one adult contemporary, uh, one hip hop, one reggae, uh, perhaps one soca, um, so that you can appeal to different niche markets um, with different products and also trying to market some of these products to um, Jamaicans in, in the diaspora, particularly in North America and um, the United Kingdom where most of them are located. So, two major approaches. One is the Caribbean Media Corporation, which I mentioned before, um, has formed a Caribbean Vision Channel, um, which is um, distributed on satellite in, in North America and on cable in the Caribbean region. It is the, the fledging aspect of what is expected to be a Caribbean um, station. We don't know if that's going to happen. Um, for the problem that I mentioned, because of this um, odd kind of ownership where it's not commercially driven and it's not funded by the state. So um, its, it's, 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 its future uh, for me is uncertain, particularly in the light of these other um, developments um, where the, the private media are forming their own groups by merging and consolidating across the region. The biggest one is One Caribbean Media. Now, One Caribbean Media is a merger of the, the CCN group in Trinidad, which owns the major newspaper in Trinidad, the, the major um, television station, and in Barbados, they own a major newspaper, a satellite distribution company, um, three radio stations, and a, and a radio station in Grenada. So that makes them uh, a fairly large uh, media group. And as they call themselves One Caribbean Media, their intention is clear to continue the growth and expansion in the region that could not happen under that private mixed state ownership that we mentioned before. The, their main competitor is the Columbia's Communication Group, which um, is headed by one of the, um, the wealthiest individuals in Jamaica and in the region, um, Michael Lee Chin, um, uh, who is listed among Forbes 500 richest men in the world. Um, and, and the Lee Chin Group owns um, red, um, television and cable in Jamaica, cable in Bahamas, cable in Trinidad, and also an underwater sea, uh, undersea submarine um, fiber cable, um, fiber optic network. So their potential for growth is the largest because they're now looking towards um, the Hispanic part of the Caribbean as well. And they will be joined soon by the um, Carlos Slim from Mexico, um, whose media operation is buying out one of the smaller um, telephone cable services in the region. So what we're going to be seeing more is a lot more competition and players in that area. So that's, that's, the, that's the big old groups. Then you have new groups that are forming. I mentioned two here, Hype and Sportsmax. Because um, Hype is a, is a reggae uh, music station out of Jamaica. Started out operating only in Jamaica but now having outlets in North America. And their intention is to do the reverse of what BET or VH1 has done by forming Tempo to come to the Caribbean. So they're going from the Caribbean this way um, with, 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 with music programs, mainly reggae and dance hall. But they're not the only one, but I mentioned them as one example of that genre. Then Sportsmax, another Jamaican company, which their um, strategy is to acquire um, very attractive um, sports products. Um, the main ones being cricket and, um, and football, uh, soccer, for those who don't know better. <laughs> um, and, and they, use the, that they use that to, and, and they have a very interesting thing because they have a mixture of subscription and advertising as their revenue base. Right? Um, 
they, they charge about um, $5 a month for a box for, for, for their um, channel in your home. Now, $5 should be seen in the context of $15 for 120 channels. So five for one, <laughs> you know, is a lot of money. But, but that's, that's their model. Um, it's driven by, and, and they're doing quite well. Uh, so they pull the programming from, and they also have, and they, they, have, they borrowed Fox, the Caribbean rights for Sp Fox Sports Network, all right? So, and they have, they, they have the rights for Italian soccer, the Italian um, um, Serie A, um, they have the British Premier, English um, Premier League, um, and they also have the Bundesliga, and they also have the South American soccer. So they have soccer from all over the world. So if you want to watch football, and we are football mad and passionate, as long with cricket, um, you have to find $5 a month <laughs> um, and to do it. So it makes it possible for them. And, and, and they bring it into Jamaica, and then uplink it back to the rest of the Caribbean, and, and they repeat the pattern there. Um, and they also get advertising, so they get two bites of the cherry. So, so those are two kinds of responses which are quite creative and which I believe are going to develop. Where they are short at the present time is in developing Jamaican sports content. Um, They're now just beginning to do that um, with some of these Jamaican sports. Okay. So in summary then, what we're seeing is that the old media business that depending on advertising um, is dead, and the new media business is still um, not yet um, taking shape, but it is taking shape. Um, it is, um, we're seeing uh, new models between media and, and, and advertising, um, as we see, for instance, in a model that we, a brand that we call Rising Star, which is a, a Jamaican equivalent of the American Idol. Um, and, and people pay for this. I mean, the, 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 the phone in to, 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 to support the stars is in no, it's like a license to steal, really. Because entire communities will support their, the people. If you get on Rising Stars, people are going to get on the phone, um, text messages in, in Jamaican dollars, right? A normal text message in Jamaican dollars is um, $3. $3. To text for Rising Star is $25. <laughs> All right? If you want to vote for a favorite star, um, a Rising Star is $25. So it's a huge, huge thing, and it is popular. And, but that's just one example of a, a switch away from advertising to getting the consumer to pay for the product indirectly. Um, and we're seeing subscription of the kind that we talked about, like with the sports, sports max um, uh, model. The, the multiple ownership is going to continue. We're going to see a lot more mergers and consolidation. And the decline in the, the state sector is going to uh, continue. The, st the strength of the old media, of course, is that they have a history of creating content. They have a history of uh, credibility in many cases. And they also have. A, a, a history of, um, of, of gatekeeping so that things simply don't happen as it would happen in, 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 in um, any of the social marketing um, networks, um, MySpace or whatever um, is your particular space. Public broadcasting, a very uncertain future. I believe that the old model of public broadcasting is just as dead as the old model of commercial broadcasting, but I also believe that um, it can be refined and because I think there are, there are some things which um, publics want which are not um, responsive to commercial uh, entities. I believe the, 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 the richness and experience of the social networks is an indication that that is desirable. What we are not quite sure is how all of that is going to happen as the broadband becomes um, more pervasive. I believe also that in terms of public policy, that one of the things is to have more public access to private media through the regulatory um, framework. Um, and it is not difficult to design if you really set your mind um, um, to it. 
the regulations that we have cannot regulate media in the internet age. Um, but at the end of the day, we are talking about content. We are talking about trying to create a Caribbean, me uh, a Caribbean presence uh, using media in the Caribbean to bring the people of the Caribbean together. I believe that that really means cultural relevance. Um, and so the search really is to find financing models that can make culturally relevant programming that can be of value to people in the Caribbean and people in a Caribbean state of mind in whatever part of the world they find themselves. I thank you for your attention.